Got so wrapped up in the politics, I forgot the next panel. Let me introduce Margie, if you would like to come up to introduce the next panel and to get us started on that. All right. We are next moving into our Women in Media panel, which I have the pleasure to moderate, but mostly I have the pleasure to listen to our two wonderful panelists talk to you. I am going to very briefly um, introduce each of them, and then um, they're going to have some opening remarks for you, and then we're going to open it up for questions, because I want to have a lot of time for you ladies to ask questions. So, Ileana Johnson, directly to my right here, is the uh, Washington editor of National Review. She's uh, been in that position since August 2014, after she worked as a national reporter for National Review, covering Congress, campaigns, and the media. So she will have lots of fun war stories for you. <laughs> Um, Ileana also worked as a producer for The Hannity Show on Fox News Channel. She wrote scripts, she produced packages and specials, and she was also a research associate at the Council on Foreign Relations. She was a staff reporter for The New York Sun, so she's got TV, she's got print, she's got online. Um, she'll have lots of good insights for you. She graduated from Yale University, where's our Yale student here, in uh, 2006 with a degree in history. And directly to her right, Catherine Kirsten, is a writer, an attorney, and a senior fellow at the Center for the American Experiment here in Minneapolis. Uh, she's a founding director of the center. She was its chairman from 1996 to 98. And she's also served as, the metro, as a Metro columnist for the Star Tribune in Minneapolis from 2005 to 2008. She wrote a column on the paper's opinion page from, from 1995 to 2003, and again from 2009 to 2013. So she's been in the media both on the reporting side as well as the, the opinion side. She's written on a variety of issues, cultural, policy, focus on education for a variety of publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, Christianity Today, Policy Review, American Enterprise, First Things. Um, for two years, she served as a regular commentator for National Public Radio's All Things Considered. So we've got radio experience up here as well. Um, Catherine is the author of Close to Home, which is a collection of columns on a wide variety of public policy issues, and um, she's an expert in the, uh, particularly in the area of education, and um, she's a wide experience also being a guest on many, many TV, radio shows, both national and local. Um, she's appeared with Hugh Hewitt, Glenn Beck, Mike Gallagher, been on Fox News, MSNBC, NPR, you name it. Um, she's also worked uh, as a board member for the Cargill Foundation and on the advisory board for the Institute on Religion and Democracy in Washington, DC. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce both of, I'm going to invite um, our panelists to uh, open with their remarks and then we'll start some questions. All right. Thank you. Ileana, you want to go? Great. When people think about conservative journalists, um, the names I think that come to mind are people like Charles Krauthammer or George Will or people like my boss, Rich Lowry. And the case that I want to make to you guys today is these are not really the people who should be your role models if you're a young conservative man or woman and you want to go into journalism. Um, conservatives right now, um, and they have for a while, they dominate opinion journalism. Fox News crushes CNN and MSNBC. Um, I don't know if you guys remember Air America, but it was the liberal uh, talk radio network that no longer exists because it was a failed business model. However, conservative talk radio hosts are spectacularly successful. Um, and conservative books become uh, 
number one bestsellers. Uh, I remember there being a New York Times article uh, talking about Bill O'Reilly being the first person in a long time to have two hmm. books on the top ten New York Times bestsellers and said the last person to do that, uh, does anybody know? Last person to do that before Bill O'Reilly was Barack Obama when he was running for president okay. and his two memoirs were uh, in the top ten New York Times bestsellers. Um, so conservatives dominate opinion journalism, um, books, radio, television, and where has it really gotten Republicans and conservatives? Um, is anybody in this room happy with where the movement is right now? So my view is sort of, it's this is great, but it hasn't produced the sort of political success that I think anybody in the movement is happy with. Um, I think that's because a lot of it is written off or ignored. It's, um, it's entertainment and for a lot of people, but it doesn't actually push the discussion or push politics in a useful direction. Um, what the mainstream media can't ignore is reporting facts. Um, and I think that's the thing. I, th I think of it as sort of the subtle thumb on the scale in every election. Um, in a close election, it's, it can be something that does matter. Um, and conservatives themselves have acknowledged this by complaining to an annoying extent about media bias. And if we care about that, um, we can go about changing it by learning how to report, sending really talented young people to become reporters. And the mainstream media is enormously powerful. And I, a lot of people disagree with this, but if a story doesn't get picked up by the mainstream media, it basically doesn't matter. And the goal for conservatives should be to get the attention of the mainstream media and force the things that we think matters to be covered by the mainstream media. Um, the extent to which this matters, I think, I saw a recent Newsweek headline um, from April 18th and it caught my attention. So the headline was, Hillary Clinton's biggest benefactor has trade links with Iran. The first paragraph of the story was this. Enemies of Hillary Clinton waiting to discredit her bid for the White House are likely to seize on news <laughs> that one of the biggest benefactors to the Clinton Foundation has been trading with Iran and may be in breach of U.S. sanctions imposed on the country. That's the sort of power that the mainstream media has to shape a story. All of a sudden it becomes not about the fact that Hillary Clinton had a deal with a major backer of the Ayatollahs in Iran, but the fact that there are all these enemies lurking in the background waiting to discredit her. And that's why it's important to get conservatives in the, in the mainstream media or getting the attention of the mainstream media. Um, I think when conservatives do it, they're having great success. And um, I'll give you a couple of examples and close on that. The most recent one is just this past week where Peter Schweitzer's book about the Clinton Foundation scandal is pretty much the only thing anybody in the media has been talking about. And it's required not only the mainstream media to cover it, Peter will be, I think, on two Sunday shows this weekend. And the Clinton team and the Clinton campaign has had to come out and respond to it. Um, that means he won. And um, my, But my favorite example is from last February, uh, February of 2014, when the website, the Washington Free Beacon, which started from nothing, um, sent a reporter down to the University of Arkansas. And the thing that I would, would call your attention to is the fact that the New York Times and the Washington Post and ABC and NBC and CBS, they have had reporters on the Hillary Clinton beat for years. But this website starts up nothing and they send a reporter down to the University of Arkansas where the papers of a close friend of Bill and Hillary Clinton's have been held for 14 years and were, had, been, had already been open to the public for four years. Nobody from the Times, the Post went, but she did. And what she found not only gave the public a fuller picture of Hillary Clinton, but was covered on the evening news broadcasts of every major network. Um, Diane Blair's, the friend of Hillary Clinton, her paper indicated that Hillary Clinton had called Monica Lewinsky a narcissistic looney tune, um, that during President Clinton's impeachment she had said, um, 
the, the press has big egos and no brains. Now, this is, these are the type of things the press likes to cover over and over and over again because it's about them. And um, the same reporter covered the fact that Hillary Clinton down in Arkansas had laughed when talking about defending uh, a child rapist. Again, like all, all of the major newscasts that had reporters on the Hillary beat, they had never come up with this. And this led, this was the lead story on all of the major newscasts on the Sunday shows. Uh, the market is starting to not notice this. The last thing I would say is there's now a real hunger in um, the news market for people who not only know Republicans and understand them, because to most people they're like exotic animals at the zoo. And even, I mean, I get booked on MSNBC they don't want you to be a conservative ideologue. They're not booking George Will or people whose positions are known, but they want somebody who's comfortable with conservatives, who talks to them and who understands that to explain this rare breed of people. And also people who are more connected than they are who can do the talking to Republicans so that they don't have to. There's a huge hunger in the market both for the stories that come out of conservative media world and for the understanding of the other side. Um, and so this is what I would encourage all you guys to do if you're interested in journalism. Um, it will get you, it will get you a job, and it will get you noticed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. To Perfect segue speak. into what I am going to say. And what I'm going to say to you is that I agree with Eliana. Getting conservatives into our nation's newsrooms is vital to the future of America. And this book explains why. It's called Left Turn, How Liberal Media Bias Distorts the American Mind. The book is by Dr. Tim Grossclose, who was Marvin Hoffenberg Professor of American Politics at UCLA when he wrote it in 2011. And using social science methodology, Dr. Grossclose examined the political content of news stories and converted this to what he called a slant quotient. To determine bias, he compared the slant quotients of news outlets to the PQs, or political quotients, of voters and politicians. And he found that the general leftward bias of the media has shifted the political quotient of the average American about 20 points wow. on a 100-point scale. The difference between the current political views of the average American and the political views of the average citizen of Texas or Salt Lake County, Utah. And without liberal media bias, he found John McCain and not Barack Obama would have won the presidency in 2008. That's how important this fight is. So what, what explains this extraordinary finding? Conservative reporters tend to see the world through a profoundly different lens than their liberal peers do, and there are not many conservative reporters. Stories that don't fit the liberal media's master narrative often don't appear in the press at all, or they are buried on page B6. And we saw this recently, we can all come up with hundreds of examples, but we certainly saw this recently with reporting on events in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, when deadly encounters occur between the police and young black men, the liberal media tend to assume that, political, uh, that, that police conduct is driven by racism. And even when the unarmed teenager Michael Brown was proved to be aggressor in Ferguson, the liberal media essentially refused to change its narrative in any meaningful way. So when the Star Tribune newspaper here in Minneapolis hired me as a Metro columnist in 2005 as an experiment, uh, I told the editor uh, that the paper was missing half the stories in the Twin Cities region. And I would get those stories. And I told him why. I have a different worldview than my fellow journalists. I have, uh, which of course enabled me to recognize newsworthiness when they would tend to miss it. I had different sources, I moved in different circles, and I had the motivation to dig deeper than my colleagues on many stories to uncover news that they might have missed. And this proved true time and again, 
as I broke stories that would otherwise have gone unreported. And Professor Grossclose actually documents uh, one of those examples in this book, Left Turn. It was uh, the case of the so-called flying imams. These were six Muslim imams whose suspicious behavior at the Minneapolis-St. Paul airport in 2006 led US Airways to pull them from a plane. Now the imams sued the airline for discrimination, but I discovered buried in their complaint that they also planned to sue innocent bystanders simply because they had apparently alerted authorities to the imam's suspicious behavior. And uh, in relation to one of the points that Eliana made, it, it appears that I was literally the only reporter in the nation who actually read this complaint. It was reported on widely, nobody else read it. Now a suit like this, of course, uh, against John Doe's like these poor folks who were targeted, uh, would likely intimidate future witnesses to suspicious behavior uh, into silence, which of course would seriously undermine America's anti-terrorism effort. And after I broke this story, the US Congress passed a law shielding bystanders who acted in good faith from suit for simply trying to protect themselves and their nation. So how do you become a reporter who can get stories like this out? Well, you might think automatically, at least if you're a member of my generation, of landing a job in the print media at a major newspaper or policy magazine. If that is your goal, you do not need to have a journalism background uh, to get it. Uh, certainly you don't, Eliana. You came out of college uh, with a history degree. I trained as a lawyer, and then I was a mother at home and a homeschooler for 15 years. And the Star Tribune's editorial page editor asked me to join the paper's board of contributors after I started to send letters to the editor and commentaries to the, to the paper's op-ed page. Eventually, this morphed into a full-time job. But as an aspiring writer, you don't need to confine your sites to newspapers or policy magazines or broadcast journalism today. The internet, of course, offers a whole new world of opportunities to people like you. I mean, you could target writing for an up and coming conservative site, and the Federalist comes to my mind, uh, on an occasional basis while putting bread on the table uh, with a part-time job in another field. Eliana's father, Scott Johnson, who graces our presence right now, exemplifies uh, the hard work, uh, exemplifies where hard work and merit can take you today. He started the influential Powerline blog with two other lawyers in his spare time in what, 2003? 2002. And uh, rather quickly, Time Magazine named Powerline Blog of the Year for its role in a headline-generating national expose. So for all of you in the internet generation, the sky is the limit, but I will save additional comments about that for our question time. Thank you both very much. <laughs> all right, we're gonna open it up for questions from the audience. And so get your questions ready, and I'm just going to start off with one question to get us rolling. Um, could you ladies share with us what was the most valuable piece of advice that you got in, in your career that helped shape your direction? Eliana? Was it your dad? <laughs> <laughs> of course! When I first came to, when I first got my job at National Review, so before I moved to Washington, yeah, it's about two and a half years ago, um, it was Tucker Carlson who told me, you know, I was sort of hemming and hawing about what I should do and National Review this and I don't know about the brand and he said to me, listen, the internet changed everything and I actually am a little bit on the old side of the internet generation and social media, but he said, nothing matters. The brand doesn't matter. Where you are doesn't matter. Just get famous. Like, <laughs> and that's, I mean, so that is what he said to me. He said, 
right under your byline, break news, and get famous. Everybody wants to hire a famous person. And I sort of kept it in mind, meaning that the only thing that matters is that I'm writing and that I'm writing good things. And I tried not to take my eye off off of the ball and he said people everybody's hungry for good quality content doesn't matter where it's being published um, as Kathy mentioned it can be on your own website but it's the quality that matters now it's not the brand uh, it doesn't matter where you're doing it how you're doing it in the internet world people can become hot commodities overnight and all of the old I, I really believe that all of the old lines, mainstream, partisan, all that is dissolving and people's work now speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, um, I, would, I would say I, I have learned two things or had two good pieces of advice. Uh, the first, I think, is to personalize your message to the extent that you can. Frame your message in terms of telling a story or at least provide anecdotes, provide vignettes, something that will show people how the, what you are writing about will affect them personally. I think because the human brain is made, it's designed uh, to help us remember stories. And people retain your point so much better, I think, when they can call to mind a story rather than abstract arguments that you've made. And just listen to the, to the politics, uh, I thought, here's an example. There were a number, several stories that that's we're going to walk away uh, remembering. I think a good example here is the Institute for Justice, which is, uh, a, 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 well, it's a, it's a think tank. It's a, it's a, a law firm, basically a national law firm, uh, whose mission is to promote economic liberty and to push back against the regulatory state. But they don't do it uh, by writing white papers full of economic argumentation. They bring lawsuits for very carefully selected plaintiffs. Uh, the, the quintessential plaintiff is the Jamaican hair braider uh, who just wants to open a little shop in her home, uh, but the state has told her that she can't have a license unless she has very expensive cosmetological training. Of course, she doesn't ever wash someone's hair. This is simply a guild mentality, a way to, to keep competition down for right. licensed cosmetologists. Um, the, the motto of IJ, Institute for Justice, is PhD. It's personalize it, humanize it, dramatize it. So that, I think, is important to keep in mind wherever you can. Also, I think it's very effective where you can to use the language and categories of thought of your liberal opponents when making your case. For you sound example, like Saul Alinsky. Ah, <laughs> no, none of this. Yeah, yeah it won't, won't get that far. But, but say, um, a very, very big issue here in Minnesota right now is the so-called racial achievement gap in our schools. We actually have the the widest racial achievement gap K through 12 of any state in the nation here in Minnesota, and. When I'm asked about that, because I write about it all the time, I, I try to, to use their terminology. I express my deep concern, which is very sincere, of course, about the nature of this gap. And I say I'm all for equity, just the way you are. But the way to achieve it is to give kids the tools in reading and math that they need to succeed, often through educational choice. It is not by doing what they do, which is to focus on racial balance in the classroom. And I say, that's the way people used to think, uh, you know, putting people in, in pigeonholes on the basis of skin color before Brown v. Board of Education. What are you talking about? So when you can use the categories of thought that they are comfortable with and they think they own, I think you're more effective. Very good. All right, questions right here. Hold on just a second. Hello, my name is Sophie. This question is for Ms. Johnson. Um, ever since I've been young, my dream has been to have a job path fair similar to yours. Like, you are the epitome of what I would like to do with my life. Yeah. So, um, my question for you is, um, could you please talk up more about your career path and how you got to where you are now and maybe the struggles you faced or how you decided this is what you wanted to do? Because I'm just a freshman in college. I don't really know the path, how to get to that location where you are now. Thank you. Sure. 
The first thing that I would say is there's a lot of there's a lot of luck and chance, and uh, it certainly wasn't gamed out at all. But I always was interested in politics, and I like to write. And so I was always interested in fields where I thought I could combine the two things, but where I, and I would do a lot of things differently, where I, did, had, I had I had the outlook that you have and known where I wanted to get when I was a freshman in college, the first thing I would have done is I would have been writing for my school newspaper. So I would definitely recommend doing that. And I found that the two skills that are in very short supply in journalism are really solid writing skills and a truly open mind. Um, even in conservative journalism, you know, I'm focused on Republicans, but within the Republican Party, there are a lot of competing people and competing ideas. And I deal with a lot of people who they just can't pry their heart away from either the Tea Party candidates or the establishment people over here. And I really am looking for people who, regardless of what they personally think, can give a clear-eyed assessment of what this person's doing over here, are they being sold a load of crap by this guy's aide, and who can tell me that, if it's the case, and put it in writing. Um, and so it just so happened that the first job that I had out of school was at a very small newspaper, and I did not appreciate it. I left after seven weeks. My dad, sitting in the back, can tell you I used to call him every night and cry. Um, because it was such a tough job and I quit after seven weeks because it was brutal and my biggest career regret is leaving that job and I went into a much cushier job. Um, if you have a job right when you graduate college where you're doing substantive work, um, count your blessings because, and I've told my two younger sisters, like you should expect to be, you know, at the, f at the fax machine, if anybody still has fax machines. <laughs> I mean, I was, I got lucky and I, you know, I squandered the opportunity. Um, and one thing that I tell everybody, that I would tell all of you guys is, the only thing that really matters is personal relationships. Um, unless you want to go to graduate school, um, you know, your GPA, this paper you write, that paper you write, your standardized test scores, they don't matter. When you do internships, what matters is your personal relationship, your social network, your, your social skills. And so I ended up back at National Review after a couple other difficult job experiences because I had kept my contacts there from a decade before when I was an intern. And so <laughs> I would... Uh, That's a really important one. So I would just encourage all of you, you know, make your contacts, keep your contacts, be in email touch with people, call them, thank people, write thank you notes, send them gifts. Um, these are the sorts of little social graces that um, I think tend to be overlooked because people are focused on their GPA or turning their paper in. And the things, I've never once been asked what my college GPA was. <laughs> I was so devastated. I think that I wasn't, you know, getting whatever academic honor when I graduated. I've never been asked about it once. Huh. Yeah. I'm going to add. Can I just, go ahead. Go ahead. Just, just add very briefly I'm, to that because I come yes. at this very, very differently than, than Eliana because I was a lawyer. I became a mother at home. I was, I had no idea how I was going to, sort of continue my intellectual life. And I just fell into what I, what I do now. And I would say the most important thing was building the network. So mm -hmm. first with the, the think tank here, which I, I built up, um, I, I built up that connection through political activism and, and writing. Uh, but then nationally, I was just a total nobody, but I started going to conferences. I went to the Second Thoughts Conference with David Horowitz and Peter Collier, and I, I went to a, a whole bunch of these, National Association of Scholars, and that's where I met the Wall Street Journal editors. And I kept contact with them, you know, 10 years later, same thing as Eliana yep. saying. So yeah, that's Networking is the most important thing. And people like sort of, they don't really know what that means, but all of you guys who are here are gonna be off all over the country doing all different things in five years. And it's that sort of thing that's really important, staying in touch. Yeah. And, you know, all you guys, like, get Margie's card, get Kathy's card. Like, you know, we're all happy to stay in contact with you. Yeah, this is a great networking opportunity. This is a great group of people to stay in touch with. And I'm just picking up on one other thing that Eliana said. Um, I've hired a lot of interns. And I know a lot of other pe people 
who start a job as an intern and then get hired. So don't be afraid at the, at the outset. If you have a great opportunity to do an internship, whether it's during the summer while you're still in school or even right after you graduate, sometimes that's a better route than just sort of taking whatever job you can get because if it puts you on the right career path, that can actually be really valuable. Um, and as Eliana said, whatever internships you do during the summers, you've got lots of summers before you graduate, this is great. So um, you know, look for making those connections and keeping in touch with those people so that you can build on, um, on those relationships and those experiences. A lot of young people who graduate from college haven't really worked at anything. And if you have some internships that you've done, that can actually set you apart from a lot of other people when you're looking for that first job. Um, and the other thing I'd echo is definitely write for your school paper, write for the website, and don't be afraid at this stage to write for free. Don't worry about getting paid for what you write at this stage. It's much more important to amass a large portfolio, if you will, of things that you have written to demonstrate that you can write and that you are published than it is to worry about, worry about getting paid. You get paid later. <laughs> um, other questions? Yes, right here. Oh, okay. Start here, then we'll go over here. Hi, I just have a question for Eliana. Um, I'm a little bit disheartened when you mentioned that broadcast journalism is now looking for people who deliver stories and people who deliver the understanding of the other side and not so much ideologues. As an ideologue, um, journalism that I'm really drawn to is usually when I learn something from what they're speaking about. Um, I was a huge fan of Glenn Beck. I really liked Judge Napolitano. Both of them lost their job at Fox. So I guess my question would be, where would ideologues best be suited in journalism, and is that practical to even be one? So I certainly didn't mean to say that broadcast journalism is looking for ideologues. You know, the people who get contracts at Fox, they're not reporters. Um, the point that I was hoping to make to you all is I don't, I happen not to think those are the people who push the political conversation um, in a direction that ultimately matters very much. Um, but the people who are contracted on Fox and who fill the airwaves all day long are partisan ideologues. Um, I worked for Sean Hannity for three years. We did not book people like me. Like, I do not do Sean's show. Um, I will not be booked on O'Reilly. They're not looking for, you know, people who try to maintain a, you know, veil of objectivity. And so there are lots and lots and lots of jobs for, uh, for journalists, but it, particularly in broadcast. And I just happen to think um, for conservatives who want to change the discussion we're having, it's not the most useful way to do it. I think we just have time Does that make for sense? one more question. Okay, right. Hi, thank you so much for speaking. I have a quick question, either of you can grab it, but um, I'm lucky enough to be assistant editor-in-chief of the conservative newspaper on my campus next semester. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but a problem that we're running into is no one picks up the conservative paper unless they're already conservative, you know? So it's hard reaching the other student population, which is who we really want to reach. And I wonder if you guys have any advice to kind of reach out to people who don't already agree with us. Eliana? <laughs> Study the New York Post. Yeah, I, I, mean, I guess what would occur to me uh, is see if you can break stories and create controversy. People are attracted to controversy regardless of who's generating it. If you can get yourself in front of students in that r way, uh, I, I think you're likely to have uh, more success. I have one more piece of advice. Humor. Ah, great idea. People love things that are funny. And, and I was serious. If you look at the front page of the New York Post every day, they're controversial, funny, 
they spend a lot, lot, lot of time on their headlines. It's all about grabbing the person headlines. in, yes. and they're really good at it. And it's not necessarily just conservative. It's, you know, it, marketing. I, I think surprise them. Uh, they, they think you're going to be grim, narrow-minded, mm -hmm. et cetera. So if you can have a, a light touch, even a little um, self-deprecation, mm -hmm. really, really surprise them. I think that, that can also advance the ball. Most school newspapers, I apologize, are really boring. And I apologize to everybody who's ever worked in one. We both have also. So um, actually, it probably isn't that hard for your paper to be the fun, interesting, provocative paper on campus. Mm -hmm. You might have an opportunity to get everybody reading your paper. <laughs> yeah, as I mentioned before, the one thing people can't ignore is the news. I think there, and there are a lot of different ways to do it, but James O'Keefe did this in his own way. I, I remember him saying he started at Rutgers, um, go right, complaining to the dean or uh, that you know, Lucky Charms was anti-Irish um, and getting it banned. But he created news, um, and the same with the Washington Free Beacon. They're breaking news and forcing Democrats to pay attention to it because it's necessarily of interest to them, creating con controversial news. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was in college, I remember the conservative paper doing like a write-up of, you know, can't miss classes, but it was like in a mocking way that was hilarious. Right. Okay, I have one more piece of advice, sorry. People love lists. Do the top 10 this, the worst five this. Great the idea. six surprising that. People love lists. All right. Thank you very much, Thanks. ladies. <laughs>